Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Jacobson. I'm the president of the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association, and I'd like to thank our Safari Society members and wildlife caretakers and welcome you to today's LA Zoom to You web chat presented by City National Bank. Last month, we heard from Ian Riccio and Chris Rodriguez, who co-presented on the anatomy and natural history of Komodo dragons and the zoo's breeding success with these large lizards. If you missed that, there is a link in the chat box and you can download that to see it later. Today, Director of Animal Programs Beth Schaefer, veterinarian Dr. Jordan Davis Powell, and coordinator of community conservation Anna Becker will discuss taper conservation at the zoo and in the field, followed by questions. We have a few reminders about the zoo platform. Only the presenters will have their audio on. And uh, if you have a question, you can type it in the Q&A window at the bottom of the Zoom window. This web chat will be recorded and will be available in about two weeks. If you'd like more information or have follow-up questions, please contact Robin Savoyan, Associate Director of Development at 323-644-4717. And we have a very special exclusive opportunity for you. We'll tell you about it more at the end of the chat, but it's you, a way for you to give the gift of conservation this holiday season. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our Chief Executive Officer and Zoo Director, Denise Ferret. Denise. Thank you, Tom. And yes, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to LA Zoom to you, web chat presented by City National Bank. And thank you for your amazing support of the zoo, especially during these extraordinary times. Um, before we get to our wonderful presentation, I did want to give you an update on the operating status of the zoo. You may have heard in the news that on December 3rd, the governor issued the regional stay at home order, um, which was triggered on Sunday. And as of yesterday, Monday, December the 7th, the zoo has again closed for an initial period of three weeks and we will remain closed until we are authorized to reopen. During this closure, our essential staff of animal care and animal health and facility maintenance teams will be reporting to the work site daily. Um, the team will be making sure that the animals are well cared for and that the facility continues to be maintained and all non-essential staff will continue to work remotely. We hope that during this three week closure that the uh, surge, resurgence of COVID-19 cases deaths, hospitalizations, and ICU capacity will stabilize and that the numbers will go in the direction that will allow us to reopen and reopen safely for everyone. So now um, I'd like to present to you this amazing presentation on tapers, their history at the Los Angeles Zoo um, and our conservation of these amazing animals. Um, when I was doing a little bit of research on our taper program, I learned that uh, it started way back literally from the beginnings, um, going back to, to as early as 1967. Um, I learned a few interesting facts. You know, the male is called a bull, the female is called a cow, and the babies are called calves. All of that, I'm sure, which is not really new or exciting to you. But did you know that a group of tapers are called a candle? I thought that was interesting. <laughs> so I wanted to share that tidbit with you. Today, you're gonna to hear from our amazing team members here at the zoo. You're gonna hear from Beth Schaefer, Anna Becker, and Dr. Jordan Davis Powell on conservations of, of, the, of the taper species here at the zoo. Um, Beth is the director of animal programs and in that role oversees all of the animal care division, including animal husbandry, welfare, enrichment, and research at the zoo. Um, Beth is also very involved in the zoo's conservation efforts, including saving the critically endangered Growers Gorilla in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where she lends her husbandry expertise to help rehabilitate gorillas that have been orphaned due to poaching. She's also very involved in the Barindo Project and the Baja Peninsula, where the Los Angeles Zoo is helping to repopulate these unique animals and bring awareness to this often overlooked species. Anna Becker is the zoo's first coordinator of community conservation. And in this role, Anna is focused on fostering a culture of conservation that empowers communities, amplifies the work of partners and improves the lives of people and wildlife. With an academic background in biology and teaching and years of professional experience in zoos, Anna brings a unique perspective to this role. 
having an innate passion for connecting nature and people, Anna is most excited to build new ways for everyone to find a place in conservation. Finally, you'll hear from Dr. Jordan Davis Powell, a graduate from Tuskegee University's Vet Veterinary School, and following graduation, she moved to Los Angeles, where she completed a rotating internship at VCA West Los Angeles Animal Hospital. In 2013, Jordan began volunteering at the Los Angeles Zoo, practicing mixed animal medicine until she was hired as a full-time zoo veterinarian in 2016. Jordan's special interests include tigers and mountain tapers. And as the only African-American woman veterinarian in the zoo profession, she serves as a role model for other young women of color in achieving their dreams of following in her footsteps. I now like to welcome Beth to begin our presentation. Thank you, Denise. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so I can get my presentation up for you. Um, okay, here we go. All right, as Denise said, I'm the Director of Animal Programs here at the Los Angeles Zoo, and I'm going to be talking about tapers and their natural history and some of their history here at the Los Angeles Zoo. Um, so I actually already peeked and I did see one <clears throat> question here already in our question and answer, and that is how many species of taper are there? And um, that is the first thing I'm going to be talking about. So there are currently four recognized species of taper, um, three in Central and South America and one on the other side of the globe in um, um, Southeast Asia. So the first species is the Baird's taper, and that um, species can be found here in Central America and partly down into South America. Bears tapers can be recognized by their nice chocolate coloration and this light coloration underneath their um, chin and chest. Then we have the mountain taper, which is um, found only above about 4,000 feet. Um, some people say above 6,000 feet. Um, it's in this green area here on the map. Um, so um, this is one of the species of taper that has the lowest numbers. There's only about uh, 2,500 of them left. Um, and they have this nice woolly coat and they can be recognized by this white here around their mouth. Both the bairds and the mountain tapers are considered endangered. Then we have the Brazilian or lowland taper, which is found throughout the Amazon basin. They have the highest numbers, although like most of the animals in the Amazon, they are definitely declining. All, all tapers are threatened by um, loss of habitat and also by hunting. Um, the um, lowland taper is considered vulnerable, um, but there is not a lot known about their actual numbers, so we don't really know their true status. They can be recognized by this um, fuzzy crest on top of their head. And then we have the Malayan taper, which is quite evident how you can recognize them. They're black and white. They're the largest species of taper. Um, they are also endangered. Um, there's less than 3,000 of them left in the wild. And then for all you taper buffs out there, you may have heard about a fifth species of taper called the Kobamani taper. It has been sighted in Colombia and Brazil. I mean, it was really only um, sort of recognized by Western science uh, in um, 2013, 2014. And we still don't have a lot of information about it, so it has not been declared its own species of taper yet, but probably will be once we get some more information on it. Um, tapers belong to the order of Perissodactyla. That means odd-toed ungulate, and despite the fact that they are called odd-toed ungulates, tapers actually have four toes on their front feet, but only three toes on their back feet. They are joined in this order by uh, equids, which include zebras, uh, domestic horses, wild asses, and also by rhinoceroses. So those are their closest living relatives. Tapers are known as the gardeners of the forest. And if you look at this picture here, you can see that they are really good at depositing poop. Um, they um, 
are seed dispersers because they eat plants and fruit. And so as they walk along, they are pooping, obviously, as, as animals do, and they deposit seeds in that poop. It's a nice, rich environment for um, plants to sprout. So they help the forests by moving around and spreading biodiversity with their seed dispersal um, activities. Um, they are also really uh, critical to helping forests regenerate. Forests that have been um, burned either through natural causes or man-made causes really depend on tapers in their poop. They have seeds that are what we call seeds of climax species. So climax species of plants are ones that form the understory. It's really difficult to help these kind of plants get started because they have to be shade tolerant because the canopy is over them. And so with the tapers spreading their seeds, they have a much better chance because they um, have nice fertilizer around them as they drop out. So they are very important in forest regeneration. Here at the Los Angeles Zoo, you can see two different species of tapers. We have um, Baird's tapers. We have a pair in our Rainforest of the Americas section. As you're walking through there, you will see them. And also we have mountain tapers. We actually have five mountain tapers here at the zoo, two of which live in our South America section, two live in, uh, in an off exhibit area, and one of them lives next to our hippos where our rhino used to be. So as you're walking around, you can see our, our different tapers. Um, historically, the Los Angeles Zoo has housed all four recognized species of tapers. In um, this picture here is actually from an article written in 1967 by the then assistant director of the zoo, Dr. Nathan Gale, who later became the director of the zoo. Um, and, and the if you all are members, which I'm sure most of you are, if not all of you, um, you get the zoo view uh, quarterly, I believe. And the zoo view actually predates the zoo here in this location. It was published even when we had the old zoo. This issue is the 1967 summer issue. And at that time, we had, I believe, three Malayan tapers. We had, I think, five Baird's tapers and three um, lowland or Brazilian tapers. And in 1967, a pair of mountain tapers came here to the Los Angeles Zoo. This pair of tapers became the founders for all the mountain tapers in zoos. Currently, there's only two zoos in the US that hold mountain tapers, us and the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo in Colorado. And there is also uh, mountain tapers at the Kali Zoo in Columbia. And their female taper was actually born here at the LA Zoo and then went um, down to Columbia. And all four of those species were successfully reproduced here at the LA Zoo. So the zoo, because we've held tapers for so long, also has a long history of conservation for tapers. We initiated a mountain taper conservation fund that supported a mountain taper population and habitat viability analysis, and they did a census of the animals. We have also, um, through our conservation grant process, supported the Mountain Taper Forever project, which is based in Columbia. We also partnered with um, SSA, which is the group that runs our gift stores and our concession stands. And they were able to sell these really cute mountain taper figurines that were handcrafted in Colombia by the founder of the Mountain Taper Forever project. And that um, money went to support that project. We currently support the Costa Rica Wildlife Foundation and NIE through the Ornado Advanced Field Studies Fund and the Los Angeles Zoo Travel Program. And we also support mountain taper research and conservation through the Stone Foundation Veterinary Advanced Field Studies Programs. You'll be hearing about both of those funds a little more from Anna and Jordan. Um, so then we also have a mission of connecting our members and guests to our conservation programs. One of the ways we do this is through our travel program. Um, in February of this year, just before 
everything turned out to be maybe not quite what we thought it was going to be for the year. Um, the LA Zoo travel program went to Costa Rica, and I was lucky enough to be able to escort that group. And through our contacts with our conservation program, we were able to connect with the wild, the Costa Rica Wildlife Foundation. Um, this is the founder, Esteban, here in the picture, and this is all of our travel group. We were able to go out um, and see a wild taper, which took some doing on their part, but was very successful. And we were really lucky to be able to see a taper. This group, um, you can see this little teeny taper right here is from very far away and he's among these farm animals. The Wildlife Conservation Foundation um, works with local farmers to be able to provide corridors for tapers to travel from between national parks and protected areas across farmland. Um, you know, uh, habitat fragmentation is one of the biggest issues that many animals face in the wild and tapers are no exception. So by working with the farmers and allowing the tapers to pass through their land, they are helping these animals to be able to survive and not have such fragmented populations. Um, so that is um, one way that um, people can help us support our conservation programs by going on our travel um, program, which we hope to resume in the hopefully not too distant future. We would love to see you all there. And once again, we thank you all for being here um, because this also helps support all of our programs here at the Los Angeles Zoo. So now I would like to introduce Anna Becker, who was the coordinator of community conservation here at the zoo to tell you about her work in Costa Rica through the Ornado Advanced Field Studies Program. Thank you, Beth, and welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well. Okay. So I am so glad that we are all spending time together talking about tapers this afternoon and um, all the work that is going on all over the world to save them. Um, before I get into uh, my presentation and experience um, with uh, tapers in the field, I'd like to take a minute for us all to engage with each other just a little bit through some word association. So if you look to the bottom of your screen, you will notice a chat button. And um, if you go ahead and click on that, it'll bring up the chat function in Zoom and you can type your answers there. I'm, I have two questions for you. And let me pull up the chat as well so I can see your answers. So my first question is, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word conservation? Zoos, protection, saving animals, gorilla protection, saving animals in the environment, saving species, helping save animals, great. Great, so those are all things that I think about too. Now I'm gonna have you do this one more time, but this time, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the words community conservation? Local, local-based connection, at-home projects, local people helping to preserve, working as a team, education. Nothing, that's great, it's okay. Working with locals, local communities, group saving, great. So the reason I ask us to do that is because for so long, conservation has been so focused on saving wildlife. And what we've seen, especially through this last year, um, is a need for conservation to work in more, to operate in more sustainable and inclusive ways. And when I, so often when I do this exercise, people are never a part of um, the first things that we think about when we think about conservation. So to successfully save a species for, from extinction, we need people to be a part of those solutions and everybody deserves a place in conservation. In 2019, I was a recipient of the Ornado Advanced Field Studies Grant that Beth talked about. And I'd like to share my experiences uh, with tapers in the field through the lens of community conservation as we just 
uh, have been thinking about a little bit there. Let's see. So I worked with Nye Conservation and uh, which was in Costa Rica. And we were, um, I chose to work with them because they were a multidisciplinary team. They were a team full of anthropologists, wildlife biologists, educators, geneticists, um, chocolatiers even, and they were all working together to save tapers through community-based models that are similar in many ways to the work that we do at the LA Zoo. And I visited three different communities across Costa Rica. Um, so in this first, this top community, um, Bahagua de Upala, that is the community that's in between, that's the corridor between two national parks that Beth was uh, sharing about. This second community is San Jeronimo. There's a lot of farming communities there as well, but coffee um, and um, citrus growing. And then in this lower community is uh, Cerro de la Muerte. And this is a mountain uh, highlands area, a lot of coffee production there as well. And each of these communities is um, coexisting with tapers. And they're all unique. And what is consistent, though, is that every community in these areas is involved in taper conservation in ways that are specifically relevant to their communities. So I'm going to focus on three different aspects of community conservation that I think are really important to where we're moving in conservation. Um, and the first is, of course, connecting to nature. Um, creating opportunities for people to connect to nature is a building block of conservation. Um, this picture is um, right before we went on a night hike, um, and it's a great example of how Nai Conservation, um, you can see Esteban right here, um, was able to work with local business owners in this area and also some of the community members to create this environment, um, this opportunity that was a safe space for people to come together from all over the community to explore nature. And, um, you know, sometimes going on a night hike um, to find tapers or to see vipers or frogs or whatever it is that you're looking at is might not feel comfortable if you're not familiar with nature or you don't feel like nature is a place for you. So providing these kinds of opportunities was uh, is such an important part of connecting people. Um, one of the groups, for instance, actually we had two groups about this size and um, one of the groups actually saw a taper and for many of the people in um, in this community or uh, with these groups, they had never seen a taper in the wild. So like, you have this opportunity where everybody is coming together to connect to nature and go on a night hike. And then half, half of them were able to see a taper for the first time in the wild. And I think these kinds of experiences can be life-changing. And I'm sure, you know, each of us can relate to our own nature story of something that happened that was significantly impactful um, in our lives. Building relationships with communities is another vital component. Um, part of my experience working alongside NIE conservation included spending time with communities at uh, community events and um, participating in a lot of their cultural celebrations. So this was um, a celebration of Costa Rica's Independence Day. And it was really important as a conservation organization that's coming into a community to work with them to save tapers to spend time with them and, sh and, and show value in that way and support them in different ways too. Um, and, and this was just, you know, and on the left here is um, me, we're just coloring pictures of tapers. So like these are really important ways that are also meaningful um, in spending time with communities. And of course, uh, education is a huge part of conservation. Um, the majority of my career at the LA Zoo has been in education. And this was um, one, of the, uh, one of the huge draws for me in connecting to Nye Conservation. Their education program is called Salvadantas, which means uh, taper savers. And in this program, and students are challenged to think critically about taper ecology and their roles in ecosystems. A lot of these communities and um, these and these kids are grow up in um, in farm communities and with parents who um, who have farmed their whole lives and and whose connections to tapers um, 
are, you know, there's been a lot, there, there's a lot of hunting in these areas or, um, you know, if a taper eats 60% of your crop, that's a significant amount of your income. So working to develop their own, their own relationships with tapers and their roles and what those ecosystems are is very important. Um, and we know that conservation is actually most impactful um, with children in their families. So throughout my visit, um, you know, I have, as, a, as an educator with um, LA Zoo, one of the things that um, I was able to do with NIE Conservation was um, spend time with uh, their educators. And um, we did, as we did a lot of reflections and talking about this program, we um, were able to see it evolve as well. And um, this, these two pictures are some of the later programs where you can see a lot of it is really facilitated. Um, and the children, the, the students are leading their own learning and thinking like scientists and building those skills to develop meaningful connections to taper conservation. Um, and finally, I just want to share a few examples of some of my favorite conservation success stories in these areas um, that I was introduced to on my visit. Um, so I'll start with the top right. Uh, those are Quetzal feathers, and um, they were feathers that were dropped onto uh, a farmer's property in Cerro de, uh, Cerro de la Muerte. And this farmer um, is one of 23 families participating in the Quebec Families Pro Quetzal Project. And that's a project that is working to save Quetzals through ecotourism. And um, it's all promoted by um, a local family hotel as well. Um, and it's just one example of how all of these families came together to, um, to come up with a solution to save Quetzals but one that also, a solution that also directly benefits um, the families in the local community by um, supplementing income through tourism as well. On the bottom right is a, this, um, so this is a, um, obviously looks like a rainforest and what it previously was is um, a cattle farm. So in this, this is Bihagua and a lot of the, uh, the area in between in that corridor is, um, is cattle farming. And um, a lot of it is also unused uh, too at this moment. And so this family chose to restore their cattle farm to native rainforest. And because they did that, they are able to now do wildlife tours on their property um, because restoring their land to native wildlife also restored the biodiversity in that area. And so now they have tapers, uh, both species of sloths, frogs, birds, bats. Um, we saw a bunch of different things just walking through. And um, so just even just being able to do that was, um, was a way to, to change their source of income and um, on their property. And then this last photo on the left is more of a personal success story that I wanted to share. Um, and it's proof that I made it to the top of one of the tallest peaks in Costa Rica. Um, it's but one of the hardest hikes of my life. And we hiked 30 miles um, in 36 hours to look for tapers and taper tracks and also to retrieve a, a camera on the other side of, uh, of Cerro Sharipo. And it's also the first time I got altitude sickness. So I'm just very proud of that one. And lastly, um, this is the, slide, the picture you saw in the beginning, but I wanted to come back to it because this photo is the, uh, a picture of the first taper that I ever saw in the wild, and it was life-changing for me. And so I just wanted to thank you all for sharing this experience with me and um, being here tonight. And with that, I will pass this over to our uh, veterinarian, Dr. Jordan Davis-Powell. Good evening, everyone. Hi, my name is Jordan Davis Powell, and I'm one of the staff veterinarians here at Los Angeles Zoo. Today, I'll be talking about my mountain taper conservation work in Ecuador. Here's a list of our project contributors. I was the only clinical veterinarian from the US. There was one research veterinarian from Smithsonian and from Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, a registered veterinary technician and a keeper also came on this trip. 
So I had to travel to Ecuador for this project, which took about 12 hours. Here are some of our objectives. First, we look at the ecology and how the animals use the landscape and their environment. Next, we're interested in the health of the tapers, comparing the wild disease diseases with the captive diseases. We are concerned with the wild dogs and livestock exposing the wild tapers to these new diseases. Outreach is also important to us. We want to continue re to reach out to local communities and schools and educate them about their native species. It's interesting that some of these, these students haven't even seen a taper or even heard about tapers. Here's some, uh, here are some of the emergent, oh, I apologize. Outreach is also very important to us and conservation planning. Here's some of the emerging threats to mountain tapers. There are some dense populations invading the national parks and this pushes the tapers out of their natural habitat. On the right is a photo of one of many water resource management projects. There are huge projects where they take water from lakes and bring them to the cities. There's also a problem with animals getting hit by cars on the new highways. Actually, one of the Ecuadorians we work with has worked with the government to set up these precaution signs. Another problem is the livestock and dogs. The farmers let the livestock roam into the national parks and these animals carry diseases and parasites that can affect the tapers. So far, one taper from the project was positive for brucellosis. Brucellosis is an infection infectious disease caused by a bacteria from Bruce, called Brucella. This bacteria can spread from animals to humans. We first started the trip talking to all grade levels at two different schools about tapers and conservation. The students were so interested, they came up to us asking how can they help. The Kayambe Coca National Park is where we did the con conservation. Here's some photos of the landscape. This is a um, representation of some of the altitudes we were hiking on different days. Here's a team consisting of Ecuadorian tra trackers and one Ecuadorian veterinarian. The dogs are also very important to us. They help help the trackers locate the tapers. Here are some of the people that, that make the whole project. Malchor and Rodrigo are a father and son team. They do all the tracking along with the dogs. Malchor is 56 years old and never stops. He, he um, basically out hikes his son from time to time. Armando on the right, he's a mastermind of the project and he bridges the gap between the US and Ecuador. Armando is the president of the Andean Bear F Foundation and directs the large animal project of the National Park. This is a photo of the team trying to track one of the tapers that were already collared. Here's a photo of the GPS collar we use. We can now use satellite to, use, to locate these animals. We only place collars on adult tapers, and these collars are programmed to fall off at a certain period of time. Here's a Google Maps image showing the taper movement. As you can see, they pretty much stay in the same area. The red squares is the last location of that animal. This month, we found evidence of home range overlap between a female and a male taper. This is the first time that we had seen this, so this is very exciting. We collect several samples to get more information about wild tapers and use this information to compare them to captive tapers. All this information will help with wild taper conservation and the care of for our captive tapers. Sorry, and this was just a lab that we made um, in the bottom of our hostel. And these are all the samples that we we take and collect. Here's a photo of me just doing a physical exam and giving some Q fluids, um, just fluids right under the skin of the animal to hydrate. 
here's a chart of all the tapers that have been in the project. When I went to this, uh, when I went on the trip, um, December 2019, we were to, able to get samples from five tapers. We only collared four since one was too young to be collared. We currently plan to make three more trips to Ecuador and continue to branch out to new countries like Peru. We are currently building conservation education programs in Ecuador. We're developing projects with the Capital University and mentorship with the grade schools. We are starting research projects this year with our captive tapers. One of the current projects is comparing the fecal biome and seeing how the seeing how the tapers natu what they naturally consume and we can try to mimic their diets in captive in captivity. First, I would like to thank Glaza and all their efforts. I also like to thank the Stone Foundation and also my keepers and curators for allowing me to practice medicine and learn about new um, new um, aspects about this species. Thank you. Jordan, are you able? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Uh, thank you to Beth, um, to Anna, and to Jordan for that amazing presentation. Um, and now we're going to open it up to questions from our audience. Okay, I have a few questions already. The first question is, why is the taper species found in South America and in particular areas of Asia? Were they much more spread more in the distant past? You know, so how would they get so if, in two such far ranging uh, areas of, of the world. Um, yeah, I can um, add something to that. I think, um, yeah, that's a really good observation. They actually, um, there's taper fossils from all over the world, um, all through Europe, um, you know, obviously um, South America, but also um, up into North America and all through um, China. So lots of Northern Asia as well as Southeast Asia. Um, there was even a Taperus californicus. So there was Taperus here. You can um, see some of the fossils here at the tar pits. Um, so they ranged all over the world. It's a really, um, it's kind of a complicated history of tapers and certainly way more than we can go into here and way more than I know about. So you should definitely look it up if you're interested. It's pretty fascinating. The whole um, perissodactyl um, order is really fascinating how it's spread around the world. Uh, thank you. Um, what predators do tapers have? Can you hear me, Beth? Yeah, I can hear. I didn't know if anybody else wanted to jump in. Oh. <laughs> so there, as far as wild animals go, um, jaguars are one of their biggest predators. Um, and then obviously humans are a big problem. They're hunted quite a bit. All the species of tapers are hunted. Um, theoretically, they're quite delicious, but um, so they that's a big problem for them. Thank you. What is the purpose of the tapers wiggly nose? I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, that is one of my favorite parts of uh, taper. And um, when you see, um, you, if you have seen some of the pictures that we were seeing, some of their noses were up and some were down and in, in different places, it's prehensile. And so when, um, you know, tapers are herbivores and um, when they're in the for rainforest and they're, um, grabbing all the fruit, that does help them to pull some of that off and to, and to use it as a tool. Excellent. Um, how old are the tapers at the zoo and do they have distinctive personalities? So we have five tapers here at Los Angeles Zoo. One female, Inca, she's 23 years old. Manuel, who we call Manny, is 18 years old. Mochi, he's 21. Sergio's 15 and Mojito is 13 years old. And of course, they all have different personalities. Some love to be um, playful, some like to be in the pool, some kind of just hang out. They're, um, Beth may be able to answer some of that too, but they all have definitely different personalities, but all very sweet. 
Anything else, Beth? Uh, no, I think that's, yeah, that's it. They all are really definitely unique individuals. Uh, how old is the species, is this species? I'm not sure which this species it is because we have two, but do you know how old the species is, Beth? Um, so if you're talking like prehistorically, it, millions and millions of years, I don't know the exact number. I don't know if either of the other two know, but they have a really long and like I said, complicated history where they were in some areas and then they seem to die out and then seem to come in from other areas. So it's, like I said, it's complicated. Um, and definitely I would say, do some reading if you're interested because it's really fascinating. So I'm gonna read this question, but I think that it was um, answered. It says, at first glance, taper snouts appear to be rather functional. Are they able to use their snout in a similar function to elephants? Um, but I think the answer is yes, correct? Everybody's nodding their heads on that. Um, what is the taper's lifespan? Well, right now the oldest taper in captivity is at um, Cheyenne Mountain and she is in her late twenties. Okay. Do we know how long they generally live? Is that about, uh, is, that, is that old? I think in captivity around that, that age um, and probably less in the wild, honestly. Okay. Um, aren't tapers a primitive species? Um, have they adapted in recent generations? I think um, they are almost the same as they were about 35 million years ago. <laughs> so they, they are a very prehistoric species. They haven't changed much lately. Um, how have you altered the zoo taper diets based on research? That's a good question. We're still in the initial stages of that. Right now, we are collecting all fecal samples and blood work from the, the, our tapers here at, at Los Angeles Zoo, and then we overnight them to Smithsonian Zoo. So they are in the process of doing fecal biomes. Um, and then some of our samples are still in Ecuador. And of course, with the COVID, we're still trying to get those samples. So we haven't made any alterations yet, but we're still collecting samples. And what does a typical taper diet consist of here at the zoo? They like browse, so a lot of different plants, um, fruits, avocado is a favorite here, um, sweet potatoes is a favorite, um, fruits and veggies. Those they, are yeah. Yeah, they get like a pellet that, oh, mm -hmm. like, um, you know how there's cat chow for cats, there's taper chow for tapers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like balanced for all the vitamin and minerals they need. And then they get, um, you know, the browse on top of that and the fruit um, and the vegetables. Is it uncommon for tapers to be found in zoos? You spoke a little bit about this in the beginning, Beth. Um, it's not entirely uncommon. Um, it depends on um, what region you're in. So here in North America, um, we mostly have bears tapers and Malayan tapers. Um, and if you go to Europe, you're gonna see a lot of um, lowland tapers um, and not so many bears. So it depends where you are. And then, like I said, we're one of two that have mountain tapers, um, three in the world, the Kali Zoo in Colombia. So um, yeah, it depends what species you're looking for. <laughs> Do you know how many tapers there are in captivity? I should know that number. I don't know um, the number worldwide. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, we'd have to look it up. If anybody really wants to know, you can get in touch with us and we can find out for you. The only ones we do know are the mountain tapers. Um, Los Angeles Zoo has the most of five. Cali Zoo in Columbia, two, and two in at Cheyenne Mountain. Um, are you able to treat the wild tapers that tested positive for brucellosis? So that one taper that was positive, unfortunately, we're getting those blood samples later, and then they are released back into the wild. So that one was not um, treated. Um, I would have to ask the, the research group if that animal is still collared and are we still following it? Okay. Um, do you, when you treat them, do you treat them, um, the, the, the tapers here at the zoo, do you treat them in their habitat or at the health center? So that's a good question too. It really depends on what's going on. Um, if there's just some type of maybe foot issue or um, 
those types of things, we can go to their uh, exhibit and take a look at them. If there's something more serious, there's been times that they have come to the health center. In the past, we've taken our tapers to do CT scans and some advanced, advanced imaging. Does the um, SSP plan to allow the LA Zoo to have babies? <laughs> Uh, so our bears tapers are part of the SSP, um, and so far we have not had any babies out of our pair. Um, we would love to, um, but they haven't yet reproduced. Um, the mountain tapers are not actually an SSP um, because there's so few of them, um, and our female is the only female in North America. She's post-reproductive. Okay. And, and so there was another question about are our tapers part of an SSP? So one species is, one species is not. Okay. Um, you mentioned it was just discovered that a male and female tapers uh, cross territories. How do they normally live? Are they solitary or do females travel in groups or mother and young? What do we know about tapers in the wild? So based on the, the tracking, they're mainly solitary. And of course the mother are mother and young are together. So this is the first time that we actually seen them together. We're still trying to figure out, did the male seek the female or the female seek the male? But um, that is, hopefully we'll get some more research. Um, I will answer the next question. Dr. Buddha did confirm that Brucellus positive taper was not collared. Okay. We weren't able to follow that. Okay. Um... So here's a similar question. It says, is there a breeding program for tapers in captivity? Beth, you just spoke about um, the species that's part of the SSP. Um, and then here's a question that says, why are groups called a candle? Now, I, I, I was the one that mentioned that in the beginning. In my research, it did not tell me why they were called a candle, that just that they are. Does anyone know why they're called a candle as a group? I don't, but they because sure bring light to us. You know, they're they're a lot of fun. <laughs> they're tapers, like candles are are tapers. That's what, I'm sure that's it. Oh, Tom, thank you for that science. That was great. Okay, well there we go, everybody. <laughs> we have a few more questions uh, to get through um, before we uh, close this segment of uh, the presentation. It says, how many infants does mom have, and how long do they stay with mom? They, they have one usually, um, and they stay with them for a decently long time, usually up to like 12 to 18 months, they'll be with mom. Okay. Well, that is the last of our questions. I want to thank everyone again, Beth and Anna and Dr. Jordan. Thank you guys so much for that amazing presentation. I love these because every time I too learn something new. And so uh, this was an amazing presentation about the zoo's history, working with tapers and our efforts to conserve these amazing species. Um, I wanna thank all of our audience for uh, joining us today and continuing to support the Los Angeles Zoo by uh, participating in these presentations. Um, we're grateful uh, for everyone. Uh, and Tom, now I'm going to turn it back over to you to close us out. Thank you, Denise. And uh, I wanna thank Beth and Anna and Jordan also. And I'd like to thank Dominic Ornato uh, who supported the, the trip, the field work that Anna did. And that's always very important to acknowledge. Um, I learned something too. Uh, although the species of tapers has been around for 35 million years and hasn't changed very much, clearly during the 1960s, the uh, mountain taper learned to use frosted lipstick. So that's how you can tell them apart. They're very fashionable. I promised you a follow-up on the special adopt opportunity. We have some taper masks that were created from original pen and ink artwork by illustrator Wendy Barnes. And this is a special benefit with your gift of $75 or more. And the proceeds benefit the zoo's adopt program and the Costa Rica Wildlife Foundation and Nye Conservation that Anna spoke about. The uh, ADOPT program includes a personalized ADOPT certificate, a photo and a fact sheet for your adopted animal, a window decal, and the handmade fashion mask by Wendy Barnes Design featuring 
an adorable, there they are, adorable taper print. Adopts are fully tax deductible. Proceeds support the 40 plus international conservation projects in which the zoo participates, helping to save rare and endangered species. So the link is in the chat box, or you can always contact Robin Savoyan for more information. Upcoming, we have uh, two more LA Zoom to you planned. The next one is Tuesday, January 5th at 4 p.m. And that will be on California condors. We have quite a story to tell. Most of you know some of that, but uh, we'll bring you an update. And then on Tuesday, February 9th at 4 p.m., we'll talk about One Health, and that's the intersection of human and animal health. And that will be hosted by our chief veterinarian and director of animal wellness programs, Dr. Dominique Keller. I want to thank everyone for attending today's LA Zoom to You web chat presented by City National Bank. I look forward to uh, seeing you the next time and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all.